So, you know, Chinese New Year was not too long ago and I was just sitting at a table um, at, the, at my paternal family's side, mm. looking at the food, enjoying it and realising, hey, objectively, this food isn't that good. I know, I know, I know it sounds preposterous, right? How dare you say your grandmother's food is not good, right? Hi, I'm Xuan and this is The Library Report, a series where we go on a journey to uncover captivating narratives and the intriguing people behind them. Join me in this episode as we delve into the mouth-watering world of food narratives and uncover the fascinating stories behind the food that we eat. Stay tuned to the end of the episode for a chance to win something special. Late night suppers with friends, recipes that have been passed down through generations, stuffing our faces at special occasions. When we tell stories of the food, we tell the stories of the people behind them. In this episode, join me as I talk to a writer slash poet and two librarians as we explore the unique relationship between the dishes we love and the narratives behind them. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Daryl. I'm a poet, editor and writer and I co-edited this book called Food Republic, a Singapore Literary Banquet, which is an anthology of food writing from Singapore. Hi, I'm Tofa. I'm an associate librarian with the National Library Board, working with the Singapore and Southeast Asia collections. My research lies in food and in how cookbooks tell personal and cultural stories. Hi, my name is Chloe and I'm also a librarian at the National Library Board. I write stories about food and family, and one of the stories that I wrote was featured in Food Republic, the anthology that Daryl edited. So from your various areas of expertise, we have poetry, we have literary fiction, we have cookbooks. What exactly is a food narrative? So I think when asking about what a food narrative is, it makes more sense to ask what a narrative is. I think a lot of people have the misconception that narrative means fiction, you know, uh, when there's a story that's being constructed. But what you realise is that even in non-fiction, there is a story. There is a story that is being weaved. There is a story that is being told. So in that sense, I would say that a food narrative is a story about food or a story that uh, uses food to talk about something. What is it that draws artists and authors to use food as such a driving point in the work that they create? When I started to edit um, the book, uh, um, Food Republic, mm. I realised that um, when people are talking about food, they're they are not really just talking about food. Like food is an entry point for something else. Mm. But it's a safe space to start from because everyone can sort of relate to food. You can sort of uh, conceptualise it, you, you feel its sensory power, you sort of feel, feel its effect on you. And then from there, you start to realise that the food is actually about something else. So food can encode passions, it can encode relationships. And so I think a lot of artists and writers that we encountered in the book uh, started off with food and then you realise food serves as a metaphor and a symbol for something else. Uh, there's this uh, quite famous short story by the, by the writer Catherine Lim, a classic uh, Singapore uh, um, fictionist. And there's this story in the book called Durians, uh, which is a, my favorite. <laughs> it's it's really a fantastic my story. story. And uh, I, I won't spoil too much of it, but the main character uses Durians as a form of revenge against uh, <laughs> against her sort of um, aunt uh, and uncle uh, who adopted her. So a just, form just... of revenge. This is so interesting because like durian is a national fruit in some sense, but it's also a very dividing, polarizing fruit. Yeah. What an interesting way to use that in a story. Yeah. Like when you talk about you know the feelings that come with food, one of the feelings is that of nostalgia. What is it about food that brings us back to a certain time or place? The most obvious association is that food is memory. Mm. So food has the effect of bringing you back to a time where things were different, or when you were very happy or very sad or, or very very angry. And so that, I think, is what uh, nostalgia is about. So when we taste the food, like all these things that you have with you, the pineapple tarts, curry puffs, the ice cream <laughs> sandwich, you think about a time that where things were different. And it helps us hold on to something from the past, especially yeah, yeah, literally hold, hold on to something on. from the past <laughs> when I think so many things in Singapore change all the time. So cookbooks are some way that people can also pass down recipes from the past, like memories that people can recreate on their own time. So was there resistance when cookbooks came into the fold of food narratives? 
So cookbooks come in a variety of forms and formats. So you have the purely instructional kinds of cookbooks that act more like textbooks, meant to be used in like, you know, home economics classes. Um, and cookbooks did emerge from a tradition or a history of um, women writing for domestic science classes um, as very clear steps for housewives, for girls and women to learn to cook. But there are also now, you know, more and more cookbooks that are a cross between a memoir uh, or autobiography and a cookbook. So it weaves in like personal anecdotes about family recipes of cooking with, my, with their grandmother, their mothers or even anyone else into an overarching narrative of say family, home, um, even migration, you know. So one book that's like that in our collection is this book called Cake. So I remember just looking through the shelves one day while I was at work and I found this beautiful picture book in the cookery section and I felt, why is this picture book in the cookery section? Did we uh, classify it wrongly? And I flipped through it and I realised that the author was talking about the different cakes that she'd eaten in her life. She painted them, she illustrated mm. them and then also provided recipes on how to make them. So I think that's a very good example of how all these genres come together. Each of them has a narrative. The pictures tell a story, the recipe tells a story and she tells a story about what each cake meant to her. Please share with us a food narrative of your own. Mine is to do with my grandma's uh, mince pork. So she has this like soy sauce mince pork, which I think we all, the, the whole family grew up uh, eating. And the way after she stopped cooking because she, she, was, she was getting uh, uh, poor in health, uh, in many ways, we all tried to recreate the recipes. My mom, myself, so especially when I was studying overseas, I would try to recreate it. And it was like 60%, so 70% there. It would be enough to remind me of home, but not, not quite there yet. And even my mom, she tried her best and it was ne never quite there. But I'm proud to report that more recently, in like recent years, my, my mom has managed to actually, like she cooked it and we all tasted it and we're like, okay, this is it. Finally. Yes. Wow. So it's like a rediscovery of that <laughs> flavour. And that, that is my grandmother's story. Oh. But I think the, the broader point is that I think, you know, once again, food is about memory and we associate it with the people that we love or that have nourished us, especially women, uh, in, in the household. And it's about recreating that feeling. And when, once you get that feeling, all these associations come back to us. So, you know, Chinese New Year was not too long ago and I was just sitting at a table um, at, the, at my paternal family's side, mm. looking at the food, enjoying it and realising, hey, objectively, this food isn't that good. I know, I know, I know it sounds preposterous, right? How dare you say your grandmother's food is not good, right? Passed down from generations, how dare you, okay? Shame upon your family and your cows. But what I mean is that Hakka food is not quite as flavorful as other culinary traditions food. What I realized is that the food actually tells a larger story of the, of, of the Hakka people. You know, uh, we are nomads. The frugality and the simplicity of the food also reflects what things were like for the people in the past. So even though things are different now, right, we don't have to scrimp and save, you can buy chicken every day. But there is a reason why on special occasions we still eat the food the way that it was made so many years ago. Yeah, my, my family has a you know similar story of like simplicity and frugality. There's there's these two a few dishes that my family would usually eat during Ramadan for breaking fast. One dish is just basically um, chopped bread, um, fried with onion, in ghee. That's all simple as that. Um, there's another one of like um, fried boiled potatoes with egg and coriander leaves, you know, like really weird combinations. Um, so I asked my grandmother, you know, is this your recipe? Where did you learn it from? She said, well, we were pretty, you know, simple back then while living in Pasir Panjang, India Kampong. Um, and we wanted to use what was like available. And we didn't have, you know, a lot of ingredients at that time. So it just came out of like, a bit of like boredom of living in the <laughs> kampong but also trying to make things work with what they have. Like creativity. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's a family staple now. Wow. And I look oh. forward to eating it every Ramadan. It's, it's tasty though. Yeah. It sounds really <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. Anything, Anything in G. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so like, does travelling to a different place change your perspective on food? 
So I actually wrote a story that's entirely about that. This was a story that was in Food Republic. It is, it is a fiction piece, but very much inspired from the time I was uh, studying overseas. To outline the story, it is about a girl who is working overseas, starts to date someone, also Singaporean, but is a lot more in touch with the Singaporean culture than she is. And through that, you know, starts to contemplate her relationship with home, starts to contemplate her relationship with her mother, as well as the food that she grew up eating. So the entire premise is that if she were not overseas and met this other person from home, all these thoughts would not have come to her. I think for me, I mean, my point is going to be slightly, uh, I'll take a different tack. And, but it does, it does sort of relate to it in the sense of when, when my grandpa died, um, I saw food in a very different context because food was in sort of uh, was an offering, and when you think of food as an offering, it's actually quite significant in a different way, because in a way, of course, uh, th um, the dead person is not going to eat the food, but it's there because it's sort of uh, it's a vestige of what they were, and so for me, it was quite interesting because uh, what my relatives and my aunts did was to basically roster a list of like the foods that my grandfather liked and deliberately went to each stall in the hawker centre to like wow. procure the food. So it was like a roster of all his favourite foods. And so it was a ritual that in some ways, of course the food is not being consumed, but it's still much more, it's so much more meaningful. So the, the difference place, maybe the different place then is that we're talking about is, is where the wake was held. Looking at food in that place made it seem so much more different. What are some of the stories that you think explores this theme of place and food? Have you seen Midnight Diner? No. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about so, it. It's this um, amazing Japanese TV series that's actually adapted from a Japanese manga series. It tells the story of an izakaya, which is this small diner in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo. Mm. And each episode is built upon the story of a customer and the dish that they requested the owner of the izakaya to make. So the izakaya is run by this one man um, called the master. It's supposed to be a place where people can come in and request for any dish they want. The interesting thing about the dishes that the clients request, or the customers request also, they're not very fancy. But then after that, the, when they're eating, it cuts to why that dish is significant to them. Yeah, so the whole show isn't just set in the diner. The diner is the catalyst for the show to explore the character's backstory, which I think is done very well. Yeah, there are also like uh, Malay short stories that were published in, um, in the Malay magazines, um, pre-independence Singapore, um, and also um, in Brita Haran um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where it was stories of people gossiping or talking, catching up with each other in the warung kopi or the kedai kopi, which is the coffee shop. Mm. So the coffee shop becomes the setting of the story. So the, a lot of conversations take place about, you know, the anxieties of rural urban migration. Some of them would talk about how their relative's son or daughter going overseas to study and then coming back speaking English with an accent and things like that. Um, and also, they, a lot of it is questioning the new values that these people who move to urban areas and also overseas adopt. Yeah. And I think also, when we think about hawker centres, mm. I mean, you can also think of a, of a hawker centre as, as a book. Each stall is a chapter, it's a story, and there are stories associated with, with each stallholder and what they have done with their whole lives. When I think about hawker centers, I, I think naturally of that there are so many stories already encoded in them and, and embedded in them. And actually, I wish more, more writers would set their, their stories within hawker centers or coffee shops in English, because that's actually not as common, I feel. It's true, like each of those stalls hold a story, an entire history that may or may not continue depending on how things go. Really hope they do, but there is an urgency in capturing all of them. Speaking of urgency, mm. um, I just wanted to you know, add about um, a story that I wrote for Seasonings magazine. Um, so Seasonings is uh, a magazine that's talking about food culture and um, food stories. I wrote a story about Geylang Serai and it's actually based on oral history recording or oral history interview that I did with my grandmother. Yeah, I intended for more um, oral history recordings but 
Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away after that first one. So I only managed to capture one session of recording. But you know that urgency to capture stories. So oral history interviews can be another medium in which we document narratives about not only just food, but you know, life in general. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daryl, Tofa and Chloe for joining us here today. It was a very enlightening conversation. Okay, before you go, if you want a chance to win a $30 Kino Kunia voucher, all you need to do is leave a comment down below telling us if you could have one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Very serious decision. Okay, if you enjoyed the video, remember to like it and also subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know when the next video comes out. Till next time, bye! <laughs>